Hey folks, thank you for joining us this Good Friday. Question for you. Have you ever had someone say something to you that you know they didn't mean to come off the way it did, but it sort of stung? Like one time I got a new pair of shoes. They were dress shoes and I love the shoes because I hate dress shoes and these were actually comfortable dress shoes. And if I'm honest, as a 48 year old balding man, I thought they looked me, made me look kind of cool. And so one day I was wearing these shoes during a service here at church. It was an evening service. And after the service, this little old lady, she, she came up to me and I'll never forget what she said. She said, what's up with those shoes? She said, they're ugly. They look like you're wearing old tennis shoes. Now here's the thing. I knew that this was an aging woman who probably wished that her pastor would wear a black suit and one of those old white collars like old school pastors used to do. I know that that's probably what she would have preferred. And I knew in my head that she wasn't the type of person I would probably ever take fashion advice from. But as much as I wanted to deny it or I wanted to rationalize that, you know, her comments were just sort of silly comments from an aging old woman, her words, they had an impact on me. I mean, I couldn't deny it. I went home to my wife. I was insecure. I said, are my shoes ugly? Do they look like old tennis shoes? <laughs> Folks, here's what we know. Our words matter. Right? We teach our kids that sticks and stones may break my bones, but, say it with me, words will never hurt me. Here's the thing about that, that phrase, that saying. It's not true. Words can hurt. Words are powerful. For example, if you're married, at some point you found yourself at a church, in front of all your friends, in front of God, and you and your partner, you made promises. You said to have and, or, and to hold. You said for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. And those words, they mattered. When an employer called you and said, you've got the job, those words mattered. When you got that letter from that college or that graduate program, and it said, you've been accepted. Friends, you know this. Those words, they mattered. When you heard the word cancer, or how about this, when you heard the word divorce? Friends, words matter. Words are powerful. In fact, the truth is, words have the power to change our lives. And so here's what we're going to do. On this Good Friday, I want to take a look at the last words of Jesus. Because truth be told, Jesus saved some of his most powerful, his most important words till the very end of his life. You see, on that first Good Friday, if you know the story, it, it didn't seem at all good for any of Jesus' followers. He'd been arrested on some trumped up charges. He was beaten, he was tortured, he was mocked, and then he was put on a cross for everyone to see. He was humiliated. But John, one of Jesus' closest friends, some many years later on his behalf, somebody wrote down the story of Jesus' life in a book they called John. And when the author of that book recalled that first Good Friday and those important last words of Jesus, he wrote this. He wrote later, knowing that everything had now been finished. You see, Jesus had now hung there on the cross, forget this, six hours He'd endured six hours of excruciating and unimaginable pain. The author would go on, he'd write this, Later, knowing that everything had been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Well, a jar of wine vinegar was there, so, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Friends, Jesus' last words were, it is finished. Now in English, it is finished, obviously, is three words. But in the original language Jesus spoke, Aramaic, it was one word, tetelestai. Tetelestai was an economic term, a word from the marketplace, from business, from banking, actually. It means 
paid in full. It's like that message that comes up when you use your debit card at Target or Walmart or you order something on Amazon. To Telestai means transaction complete. These were his last words. It is finished. It's been paid in full. The transaction's complete. So here's what I want to do tonight. I want to wonder with you, when Jesus said, it is finished, what was finished? What was paid for? What was paid in full? What was completed? What was the it that was finished? Now, there's a pastor by the name of Louis Giglio who unpacked this one time. He suggested that there are four things that were finished in that moment that Jesus, that Jesus died on the cross. You see, the first thing that was finished is sin. Now, that's not a word that we use a lot around here because it, it sort of seems like an ancient churchy word. We know it's a, a word for stuff that we're not supposed to do, but it's kind of a weird word. Sin is when we choose to turn left in life, when we know that the healthy thing, the best thing for ourselves and for our families is, well, a right turn. It's choosing to put other things before God and the healthy, abundant life that God wants for us. The Bible says, actually, that the penalty for sin is death. Not actual death, but sort of a spiritual death. It was believed way back when that the consequence for our sin was that we disappoint God so much that God, God leaves us that God is disgusted and will abandon or desert us. The penalty for sin was believed to be separation from God. But when Jesus says it is finished, the first thing that's finished, the first thing that was paid in full and is done and over with is this idea that sin can somehow separate us from God. That God, seeing our sin, would be repulsed and leave us. Friends, the cross reminds us that that's not how God works. That way of thinking, it's done, it's over with. On the cross, God declared in Jesus that sin no longer separates you from God. That's the first thing. The second thing that was finished on the cross was our need for striving. Now, some of us grew up in families and churches that led us to believe that we are guilty, miserable people, and so we need to earn God's love. Some grew up believing that by doing all the right things in just the right ways, we will we'll get God to love us more. It was just the same in that ancient world Jesus lived in. There was this sort of religious system that included sacrifice and all kinds of rules about things like food and hand washing, and how you were to cut your hair and what clothes you were to wear. You see, it was this system that suggested that by getting things right, by jumping through the right hoops, you earned God's acceptance and God's favor. That God was, well, inherently disappointed with you, so you need to prove to God that you are worthy. Here's the deal. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And when he did, all that thinking was finished as well. Jesus jumped through the ultimate hoop, so that you don't need to. So that you don't need to live your life striving to be perfect. I mean, the truth is tonight, some of you are absolutely exhausted. You're exhausted because you're trying to be the perfect mom. You're trying to be the perfect dad, the perfect son, the perfect daughter, perfect at your job. You get perfect grades. You've been striving to have the, the perfect house, the perfect social media feed, the perfect image. Folks, on the cross, Jesus said, all that, it's finished. There's no more need for all that striving. And here's the thing, Jesus didn't stop there. On the cross, God also put an end to shame. Uh, now, here's what I know. This one affects a whole lot of us. There's that thing in your life I know you are ashamed of. You hurt those people you love. You made that huge mistake. Someone violated you. You weren't the father, the husband, the mother, the wife you should have been. There was that affair, that financial trouble you got your family into, that thing you did that you've never admitted. You've tried to convince yourself that you've moved past it, but you haven't. 
The cross says you don't have to carry that shame around anymore. It's been paid in full. The transaction's complete. It's finished. It's done. And finally, on the cross, the fourth thing that God puts an end to is self. Our selfishness. Our self-righteousness. Our self-centeredness. The idea that we are self-dependent and self-reliant. It's all done because this can't be missed. On the cross, Jesus did all the work for us. It was Jesus on that cross. He did the work, which means our self-righteous efforts and our self-centeredness, that thing inside us that is always wanting us to be on top, the cross puts an end to all of that. Jesus said, you don't need to feel as though you need people you can look down on. I've freed you from that. Freed you to live a larger life because truth is a selfish life It's a small life. Jesus put an end to this idea that the end all be all to life is me. God freed us on the cross to live for other people. It is finished. It's been paid in full. The transaction's complete. That's why we can call this day Good Friday good. On the cross, Jesus paid a bill that not a one of us could have paid ourselves. Looks as we close... My question for you on this Good Friday is this. What is it that needs to be finished in your life today? What's the it in your life that you need to leave at the cross this year? What's the it that needs to stay right here that you need to hand over to God in exchange for God's peace and God's hope and God's joy? To tell a story. It's the word for it is finished, paid in full. The transaction's complete. In the original Aramaic, it has sort of a a double meaning. On the one hand, it speaks uh, to a moment when a debt has been paid, the moment when a transaction is complete. But to tell a story also speaks of sort of an ongoing, uh, a repeated paying, a repeated completion, uh, a finishing of things that is sort of ongoing. It wasn't just a one-time event that happened some 2,000 years ago. So my question again is this. What needs to be finished in your life today? What choice do you, you keep making or, 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 that's hurting you rather than helping you? What sin needs to be finished? What striving needs to be finished? You're just running, trying to be perfect, always trying to impress people, Uh, sometimes people you don't even like. How have you been living your life trying to oppress God? And you need to put that thinking in the past. What shame, what shame needs to be finished? That thing you did, that thing you said, your alcoholism, that moment of adultery, that mistake that you're just too ashamed of? What shame needs to be finished? What self-righteousness or selfishness needs to be finished? You see, on that cross, Jesus said, it is finished. That sin, that striving, that shame, that self-righteousness, I've taken it all from you to tell a story. The debt is paid. Transaction complete. It's finished. I've taken them all so that you may know my grace, my peace, my love, and ultimately my joy. Look around and all I see are burning buildings, barren trees. Hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc Son of man, I know you see The deepest depths are known to me You have planted seeds among the ashes You rebuild, you restore all that's broken Turn all that stolen from your children. The 
that's what you do. So be still, my anxious heart. All that's gone is never lost. And he will is here and he is faithful. So I will let my praises stop. Sing it from these rubble rocks. I know you are good and you are you